evening, everybody, and welcome to the November Book Buzz panel. I also want to welcome the viewers who are at home. Um, hopefully you're here and you come in and you request some of the books we're going to talk about today. And just a couple of things. We have a huge gift of reading display at the very back, which is some of the wonderful books that you may want to think about giving to loved ones for the holidays. Uh, you can check them out, you can take a picture of them, you can do, they're right there for your access. We also have apple cider, donuts, some pastries at the back, feel free to get up and help yourself at any time. This display here is a display of all the books we're going to talk about tonight. We have several copies that are ready for checkout, um, so feel free to take whatever you like with you this evening. My name is Karen Gallagher. I work at the Circulation Desk here at the Westwood Library. And I'm going to talk about, uh, we, have, we each have three books. My first book is, <clears throat> I'm going to say first off, don't judge the book by the cover. Um, Alifair Burke is a wonderful mystery writer. It's a woman. Some may think, you know, a lot of people think, oh, that's a man's name. No, it's a woman. And she's actually James E. Lee Burke's daughter. The, uh, the story behind this book is very interesting because I love a good psychological thriller. And I have to say, even though this was slow to start out, it really met my expectations. So I have a, a little bit of information I'd love to give you about the book. And as I said, then we have several copies that you can check out if you like. The, the story is uh, narrated by Angela, who is a single mother of a young boy called Spencer. She um, <clears throat> does a lot of catering in the Hamptons. That's how she earns her living. She lives with her mother. One of the catering parties, um, she meets a, a gentleman called Jason. Jason Powell, a New York economics professor, a successful author and runs his own established consulting firm. After a short romance, Jason proposes to Angela. And so Angela and Spencer relocate to Manhattan. Angela saw this as a chance to reboot her life where no one knew about her tragic past. Um, the story goes on. Jason is becoming more popular. Uh, Angela is looking for a low-key life until um, it starts to surface that there is a, a sexual accusation against J Jason, her husband, who's an intern. Um, starts to, Angela starts to worry about it. They seem to have a happy life. They really have luxury. They don't have to worry about anything. Until the second um, coincidence happens where a consultant, Kerry Lynch, who is now accusing the same man, Jason, of rape. The um, investigation follows with the detective Corey Duncan, which is a really strong personality in the book and very likable. Um, the story picks up a lot of pace. Angela panics when one of the accusers disappears, having to face the reality of Jason's demons and her own. The New York Police Department Special Victims Unit now why the investigation and start looking into Angela's past. Part of Angela's, uh, part of her psycho is that she actually feels sorry for the intern, not so much the consultant. Um, it's one of those things where if you're the kind of girl that you've been accused of doing something, but it's because you are that kind of girl. Um, and as I said, don't be fooled by the cover on this one because it really has a lot to do with Jason's scandal and Angela's secrets. So it is a great read, as I said, it's psychological, it, the suspense, lots of twists. Uh, there is a movie out now called The Wife. Um, it's based on the book by Meg Wolitzer with Meryl Streep. It is not based on this book. There was some confusion about that, but as I said, don't pay much attention to the cover until you read the book. Okay? Helen. I'm Helen Rosendis. I worked here at the library for 30 years. I know a lot of you. 
uh, then let me come back every once in a while. You know, I, I do this kind of thing, and I also work in reference sometimes when someone gets ill or is on vacation. So you may have seen me there more recently. Um, the first book I want to talk about is uh, not the first one on your list, so just ignore the, the way the list runs on the sheet. Um, no matter when you were a teenager, uh, whether it was in the 50s, 60s, through the 90s, who knows, we're not judging on that, but when you were a teenager, I'll bet we all saw about the same scary movie. You know, the ones where there's teenagers running and screaming, and there's buckets of blood, and there's um, a maniac killer on the loose. It might have been in a snow lodge, it might have been in a cabin in the woods, it might have been in a summer camp, but it was pretty much the same movie where everybody gets killed, except the last person. And the movies had a word for that. They were called The Final Girl. <laughs> this book, The Final Girls, by Riley Sager, sort of builds on that concept. It could very well be a, a horror movie. It's scary, it's psychological. There are three final girls from different places and different times. They, the first was Lisa, who uh, hid and escaped the, the murders that her nine sorority sisters suffered. Then there was Samantha, Sam, she calls herself, and she managed to kill the murderer of the people in the small motel where she was working for the summer and save herself. And then the final one is Quincy, who was with friends on a vacation in a cabin in the woods. They were all killed off. She ran screaming through the woods and bumped into the arms of a cop who rescued her and became her mentor and friend. She doesn't remember much of the attack. It's her way of blocking it out. The other two were very affected by the traumas they lived through. But now Lisa, the first one, is dead. Sam shows up on Quincy's doorstep, insisting that someone is out there killing the final girls. And they need to work together. But Sam is so traumatized, Quincy can't decide whether she really knows something, or she doesn't, or if she's just wacko. <laughs> um, so she must decide then who she's going to help, where she's going to get help, and what's going to happen. Now, it sounds like any other thriller of the week, but the writing puts it way above all the normal run-of-the-mill thrillers. Um, it got star reviews and everything. Uh, it's a fascinating exploration of something we've all heard about. So I, I highly recommend it. Hi, my name is Karen Kagan. I work in the children's department. I've been here 16 years. Um, and uh, I've done another book buzz before. Uh, I'm going to talk about um, three books. Um, the very first one um, is called The Good Neighbor, The Life and Work of Fred Rogers, Mr. Rogers. Um, I've always been interested in Fred Rogers and his history. Um, I grew up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and that's where Fred did all his work. Uh, he grew up in Latrobe, Pennsylvania, the home of Arnold Palmer, who was also his friend. Um, and um, he started a television show before, a couple of television shows before Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. That didn't come on the air until 1968. Um, but in the early 50s, he started a show called The Children's Corner with Josie Carey. And that is where the puppets that you would see on Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, Down the Strike the Tiger, X the Owl, Henry the Pussycat, etc. He already had them before that, um, but he started to try them out on a 15-minute show on WQED, which is the local Pittsburgh public television station. And I was born a little bit after that, but my sister remembers all the songs, and we had a record album that has oh. <laughs> characters, and um, Daniel's right there, and that's Josie Carey. Fred's not on the cover of this, but Fred was always excited and loved the puppets, and he's one of the earlier, um, sort of a, I don't know what you would say, a pioneer in the puppet world, um, like Kukla Fran and Ollie, that show that was on as well. 
um, in early television, it was a medium that he wanted to try to use television to really reach children. And I know he really succeeded because um, so many people loved his work and still do. Um, this is the full, first full length biography of Fred Rogers. And, um, you know, I kind of thought growing up in Pittsburgh, I knew everything that I wanted to know about, or but I thought I knew everything about Fred Rogers and his drug <laughs> No, I learned a lot. Um, not just the, I knew he was an ordained minister, and he was Presbyterian minister. Um, I used to work for a dentist in downtown, and he was a patient there, and I got to meet him once. When he was getting his teeth. And <laughs> I was an assistant, so I never got to see him, because he didn't have a caddy, so, yeah. So one day I said, I have to meet him, and I did, and he was lovely, just the way you would think he would be. Um, and I had other connections with him, just, I was an early childhood major in college, and I've always worked with younger kids, and, you know, hence getting to the library and the children's room, but um, he was always so interested in the very young child, and he used to um, have a, he had a mentor, Dr. Margaret McFarland at the University of Pittsburgh, and he would talk to her all the time about what is the best way to reach children? How can I reach them with this medium called television? And so he did, part of his ministry was when he was working on the children's corner, he would go to the Arsenal Children's Center and work with children. And he learned a lot about the early childhood years. And that's even before Mr. Rogers came on. Then he went up to Canada. This is what I never knew is he went to Canada and he worked on a television show called Mr. Rogers. And that's where the trolley, the sweater, the shoes, everything was born there. And I thought it was born in Pittsburgh, but now it was in Canada. But he brought everything down. That was also a 15 minute black and white show. And he did that for about four years in the early 60s. Then he came back to Pittsburgh with his family and went back to WQED and he started Mr. Rogers in 68. And that ran until 2001. And it just changed the lives of children all over the world, really. And Fred, he passed away in 2003, and he had stomach issues. And, um, but after he died, his life, his work still lives on. Uh, anytime there's a disaster that happens, 9-11, or um, shootings that are happening all too often in this country, he comes on, you see him, you know, on Facebook, uh, internet, you see him, and he'll say, like, when he was a boy, this is a quote, when, he was, when I was a boy, I would see scary things in the news. My mother would say to me, look for the helpers. You will always find people who are, help, who are helping. And then another quote, which I think is just so cool, is there are three ways to ultimate success. The first way is to be kind, the second way is to be kind, and the third way is to be and I think he really did that with all his work. So if you really want to learn more than you ever think you would ever want to know, but it's great to know about Fred Rogers, I recommend this book. And my name is Patty Wave, and I work here at the Main Library, and I also work at the Islington Branch Library. And the first book that I'm going to talk about is Beneath a Scarlet Sky by Mark Sullivan. And before I get into the details of what it's about, I wanted to read from the author's preface because I think especially where we're heading towards the holidays and it's decorated so festively and everything, but this, his, his preface reminds me of one of my favorite characters, George Bailey. So um, he writes, in early February 2006, I was 47 and at the lowest point of my life. My younger brother, who was also my best friend, had drunk himself to death the summer before. I'd written a novel no one liked, was embroiled in a business dispute, and stood on the brink of personal bankruptcy. Driving alone on the Montana highway at dusk, I started thinking about my insurance policies and realized that I was worth much more to my family dead than alive. I contemplated driving into a freeway abutment. It was snowy and the light was low. No one would have suspected suicide. But then, in my mind's eye, I saw my wife and sons in the swirling snow and had a change of heart. When I pulled off the highway, I was shaking uncontrollably. On the verge of a breakdown, I bowed my head and begged God and the universe for help. 
I prayed for a story, something greater than myself, a project I could get lost in. Believe it or not, that very same evening at a dinner party in Bozeman, Montana, of all places, I heard the snippets of an extraordinary untold tale of World War II with a 17-year-old Italian boy as its hero. So he goes on to meet, uh, uh, find Pino Lella, who was a teenager in Italy during the war. Um, his home in Milan was bombed by the Allied forces. And um, after that, he was in an underground railroad helping the um, Italian Jews to escape over the Alps. His parents forced him to enlist in, as a German soldier because they wanted to save him from combat. And so when he, he became the personal assistant to one of Hitler's you know, generals in Italy, Hans Liers. And so what unfolds is just an incredible story of how he, as a German soldier and as his personal assistant, is able to really help the Allied forces um, against the Germans. It's, even though he um, interviewed Pino Lella for this story, it is considered a work of historical fiction because he created some of the dialogue that, um, that is in the book, so it's not considered nonfiction, but it is very close, and he interviewed um, many, many people for this book. And um, Goodreads says, fans of The Nightingale, All the Light We Cannot See, and Unbroken will enjoy this riveting saga of history, suspense, and love. And it's being made into a movie. Yeah. So I highly recommend this book. I think it's a great book. I'll do my World War II one. Um, so the first book I want to, oh, I'm Jenny Hoff. I'm a part-time reference librarian here. I also work at the Brookline Public Library as well as a reference librarian. Um, the first book I wanted to recommend is The Women in the Castle by Jessica Shattuck. And she actually is a Brookline author, and she wrote the book in the Brookline Public Library. She, uh, she came to speak in Brookline, and she said, I wrote it between 8 a.m. and 2 p.m. <laughs> because she has three young children, so those were her writing hours, and I think it took her quite a while. I think it took about 10 years to write. Um, but it is also a World War II book. And it is the story of the German um, resistance within Germany during the war. And particularly a true event <coughs> is at the, at the beginning of it, which is the um, German resistance made an attempt to assassinate Hitler, which of course failed. And that's a true event. Tom Cruise made a movie about it. Um, but, in the, and of course, they were all caught and they were all killed. All So the women in the castle are the wives of these um, resistance people, this resistance movement. And the main character is Marianne, and she has sort of taken it upon herself to um, help. It, the most of the book takes place after the war, and it actually comes all the way up until 1991. Uh, so she's taken it upon herself to find, first of all, because after the assassination attempt, all of the women families sort of scattered and then the war's over and they're scattered even further. So she first attempts to bring them all together and, and bring them to this abandoned castle in Bavaria and sort of help them piece their lives back together after the war and protect them. And of course it quickly becomes clear that the sort of black and white of um, good and evil and who was on the right side throughout the years of the war and before the war and after the war is not very clear. It's a very gray situation rather than black and white. And it's really very interesting story of, of guilt and complicity and resistance and all of the sort of ways that people survive fascism and, and, and come through it. Um, and she, when she came to speak to Brookline, she talked about regular, or ordinary Germans, that she wanted to write a story about the ordinary Germans. And in fact, her grandparents had been members of the um, Nazi party, 
and she had sort of known it all her childhood that it was this kind of shameful thing that had, was in her family. And when she began to write the book a long time ago, she her grandmother was still alive, and she went to her grandmother and said, will you talk to me? Will you talk to me honestly about what you did and what you were, what you thought you were doing? Her grandma and grandfather were involved in one of these agricultural youth programs very early on. And so it was really interesting, and the grandmother surprisingly said, yes, I'll tell you whatever you want to know. I will, you know, I'm willing. And I think it's interesting to hear those stories, because a lot of times I think the stories get buried. So it's a great book. I highly recommend Well, I'm Susan White. I work in circulation. And the book that I'm going to talk about is Leadership in Turbulent Times. It's Doris Kearns. Goodwin's latest book. It's, uh, number one, it's a wonderful Christmas gift for anyone who likes history. Um, I, I can't recommend it enough. The Warren Buffett said, business leaders uh, ask me, with whom, with what historical figure would you like to have lunch? Doris Kearns Goodwin has prepared a marvelous banquet with her four leaders whose lives provide lessons for all of us. Pull up a chair. I think that's just a wonderful uh, introduction. Uh, the four presidents that she's written about uh, are President um, Lincoln and Franklin Delano Roosevelt, Teddy Roosevelt, and Johnson, Frank, uh, Lyndon Johnson. She has written biographies of all of these. The book is divided into three parts. The first part describes the traits and early upbringing of these men. They're all driven by ambition and advanced at an early age to leadership. Lincoln had an improvised, impoverished childhood where the, both of the Roosevelt's had privileged upbringing, and Johnson identified with his father's political ambitions. The second part is how they recovered from their lowest points. Lincoln, when he failed to fulfill his legislative agenda, he broke off his engagement with Mary Todd, and he fell into a deep depression that almost led him to suicide. But his friend said to him, look, You've got to shape up or you're going to die. Or they might not have said that, but <laughs> And he said, well, I can't die now because nobody is going to know me. So he wanted to make sure that people would know him. He would leave a legacy of good work. So he decided that he would shape up, and he did. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt saw both his wife and his mother die the same day and that sent him into a deep depression. He went to the Badlands in North Dakota for two years where he built a ranch and had cattle and did all kinds of exercise and got, got very used to the outside and had always had an interest in that. Theodore Roosevelt, I mean uh, Franklin Roosevelt, got polio at, at, at early age, and he was crippled from his waist down. And he was actually out of action for seven years. So he, along with some help from uh, one of his wealthy family members, uh, started a uh, spa, more or less, for uh, people with polio, and he taught them exercises. He was called the doc, because he was the one that taught them the exercises, and help them with their own peace of mind and keep them optimistic while they have this disease and as they improved a bit. So that's what he did. And, and uh, Lyndon Johnson was, um, he, he was, when he lost his uh, bid for the, the Senate, it threw him into a very deep depression. And it stayed with him until he won the Senate seat in 1948. So that's how they all got through their lowest points. And as far as um, the 
third part is how they succeeded at their biggest moments in the presidency. Lincoln, he unveiled and implemented the Emancipation Proclamation. Teddy Roosevelt interviewed in and mediated the coal strike of 1902. Franklin Delano Roosevelt attacked the Great Depression during his first 100 days in office, which was actually called the New, New Deal. And Johnson, he pushed through his civil and voting rights agenda in 1964. So all of these presidents had a chapter dealing with each particular segment. And the reading is wonderful. It sort of makes you realize that there's an awful lot you maybe never knew or that you've forgotten, and you really want to learn more. It's absolutely great. Uh, a couple of interesting things I thought was they talked about um, the fact that people needed to unplug them. You know how we're so plugged up, everyone is plugged in now? Well, they, they needed to unplug. So uh, the, uh, Lincoln went to the theater. Maybe he went not the best <laughs> He went to the theater. And uh, Teddy Roosevelt exercised for two hours every day. And Franklin Delano Roosevelt uh, made sure that they had dinner parties at night where people could only discuss the current events, uh, movies, books, but they could not discuss the war. And Lyndon Johnson, he could not really unplug. He was always plugged in, so much so that he had a telephone installed uh, right on a uh, right on a float on, in, his, in his pool. So he was sort of sort of from he sort of a lot like the president we have today cannot be unplugged. Uh, I thought that was sort of an interesting point that she made. And Doris Clance Goodwin calls these four presidents her guys because she spent so much time writing about them. So she's really uh, has interesting points. She's a great writer. Um, let me just read something that she wrote when she was interviewed that I think makes a lot of sense. You write that the example of Lincoln's leadership has provided the leaders who came after him with a moral compass. How can Americans in a divided nation rediscover a shared purpose and vision? What history teaches us is that leadership is a two-way street. Change comes when social movements from the citizenry connect with the leadership in Washington. We saw this with the anti-slavery movement, the progressive movement, the civil rights movement, and the gay rights movement. Whether the change we seek will be healing, positive, and inclusive depends not only on our leaders, but on all of us. What we as individuals do now, how we band together, will make all the difference. Our leaders are a mirror in which we see our collective reflection. With public sentiment, Lincoln liked to say, nothing can fail. Without it, nothing can succeed. And Doris Good, uh, Kearns Goodwin made a statement uh, about her four guys, as she said. Uh, and she said, these times must have seemed even more perilous for them. Goodwin noted that the struggles these presidents faced, and America got through it. There's something about the strength of this country that should give us hope. Very good. That particular book that Susan uh, just reviewed for everybody, um, we have ordered extra copies of it. It's extremely popular right now. So if you'd like to request it, we're happy to do that at the desk afterwards. Um, I also want to remind you that feel free to get up at any time. We have apple cider, donuts, pastries, water, whatever you'd like. Uh, so my next book, and, um, this is by Chanel Clayton. It's probably a name that you're not too familiar with. I wasn't. Um, the title of the book is Next Year in Havana. And it has a wonderful cover. Um, it, it is the story of the Cuban people. Um, it's got a dual timeline. It's based on 
the story back in the 1950s when a grandmother, part of a larger family, um, her father was a sh sugar baron in Cuba, but because of the brutality in the regime of Castro, uh, it was time for the family, four sisters and a brother, to leave and move to America. Um, so as the story goes, uh, Marisol, who was the granddaughter of Elise, um, she loved her granddaughter, granddaughter deeply, and, Elise, and uh, Marisol looked up to her grandmother, spent a lot of time with her. She pretty much replaced her own mother for support. Um, so Elise passed away, and one of her last requests was to have her ashes spread in her beloved Cuba. And so the story goes, uh, Marisol travels, she puts the ashes into some kind of a bottle or perfume or some kind of cosmetic case, so she, she's not questions, questioned when she's uh, going through the customs. Um, so what she's heard from her grandmother is something compared to a lighter version of what she sees when she gets there. Um, she is picked up by uh, Louis Rodriguez, who is um, the son of a very good friend, a, a great grandson of a very good friend of her grandmother, Elise. Um, he picks her up, but it's, it's a wonderful story. Um, Marisol is a freelance journalist, so when she gets to Cuba, she has to be extremely careful because of the regime and the restrictiveness of information. Um, her grandmother Lee's passed away, and this was the big thing that she got there: is where am I supposed to spread these ashes? So she meets Louis Rodriguez, um, and I have to tell you, there's quite a bit of um, passion involved in this relationship. So be prepared. Uh, when she gets there, Louis really wants to show her around the island and give her some idea of the culture and the customs. Um, and she just falls in love with the place. The author, uh, Chanel Clayton, does a wonderful job of describing the culture. It's like going upstairs and getting a travel book and viewing it or listening to a DVD or watching a DVD. It's just, you would, you would think you were there. And so I know it's one of these places now that we can actually travel. Um, and I think I'm going to put it on my list of places to see in the future. But um, when she gets there, she meets a couple of great aunts that she wasn't too aware of, but they had kept a bundle of letters belonging to her grandmother, Elise. And she finds out from those letters that her grandmother was madly in love with a gentleman named Pablo, who was actually the eyes and ears for Castro on the street. So. Uh, it's a big secret that Elise kept, you know, her father had been a sugar baron, it was something that they just weren't going to agree with. Um, and in the middle of it all, as I said, Louis, Louis and uh, Marisol start to generate their own relationship. The, um, the fact that she's a journalist, he now is concerned with her now that he actually cares about her. Um, and it becomes part of the bigger story that what is going to happen, how long can she stay. She starts to meet people who knew her grandmother. And um, the more she hears, the more she realizes what a wonderful woman she was. So I have to give it to Chanel Clayton for a wonderful portrayal of Cuba, the, uh, just the strength and courage the Cuban people have and how much they really cared about um, their island and where they came from. So this is really something I'd recommend if someone's looking for a heartfelt story. Uh, it really is it's a good one. A novel by Larry Watson, Montana, 1948. Gives you the place, the time, and a slight feel for what you might be learning. It's the story of three generations of ranchers. The old man owns the biggest spread in Montana. He's been in politics and law enforcement, and he knows secrets about everyone, and he knows where the bodies are buried. <laughs> he has two sons. One came back from the war as a war hero. 
and is a prominent doctor in their town. Um, he's the golden boy, his father's favorite son. The second son is the sheriff. He's also a rancher of a smaller size, but he's the sheriff and has always wanted his father's approval. The sheriff has a son, and I'm going to read you just the opening of this book. From the summer of my 12th year, I carry a series of images more vivid and lasting than any others of my boyhood, and indelible beyond all attempts the years make to erase or fade them. A young Sioux woman lies on a bed in our house. She is feverish, delirious, and coughing so hard I'm afraid she will die. The book is told through the eyes of this 12-year-old boy and covers one summer. It covers uh, very heavy topics that are still alive and well today about racism and bigotry and how the Native Americans in that time and place were uh, damaged and vilified. Um, it comes to light that there's been molestation and rapes of some of the Native American women and it's a member of this family. So the sheriff has to decide what is more important in his life and in his work, whether it's um, family loyalty, winning the, the benefits of his father, whether it's the laws he has sworn to uphold. But then something more and worse happens, and he then must really look at the question of justice versus privilege. Um, it's beautifully written and a very real strong sense of time and place. It's not a normal Western and um, it's a very slim book. It's a very fast read. I would recommend two books. This gifts this it has come out in a really nice um, pretty paperback copy. For those men in your life that you sometimes have difficulty <laughs> buying things for, I would highly recommend this. I think it's a woman's book as well because it deals with women in a very good way, the women who love these men. But um, it is a book that a man would really uh, appreciate. And it's not very long. <laughs> so if you're trying to get somebody you know to read um, a non-Western Western, yeah. this, is a, this is a really good one to pick. Beautifully written too, just every word counts. So the book I'm going to talk about next is called All You Can Ever Know, and it's a memoir by Nicole Chung. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's new. It's something that you won't be able to see here tonight because everybody wants it. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, I saw about it um, a few months ago on, uh, I'm on a Facebook that says Families with Children from China because we adopted our youngest from China in 2005. So I see different little things on the feed and I saw this book and I thought, I have to read it. Um, she is an adoptee. Um, she was born in 1981. She's Korean, but she wasn't born in Korea. She was born in Seattle, Washington. And her parents, they owned a some kind of a store in Seattle, and um, she was born premature, and she wasn't, the doctors didn't think she was gonna survive very well, she's very tiny, and, um, but there was a family, a, a couple in Oregon that really wanted to have children, and weren't able to have children, and so they weren't really on any kind of adoption radar or anything, um, they just, really wanted children so badly, and somehow, through one connection or another, brought them to Seattle, to the hospital where Nicole was born, and brought them together. And so, um, but this was 1981, so things have changed a lot, maybe not always in adoption since then, but she was the only Korean person in Oregon. Basically, that's the way it was. Um, Seattle might have had more Korean families, but where she lived in Oregon, nobody. It was all white families. And it was really difficult for her growing up, especially when she got to school. Kids taunted her, teased her, said the most horrible things to her every day of her life, especially it all happened on the playground. 
So the teachers couldn't really do anything because they weren't there. It was all done that way. Kids that she would carpool with were doing the taunting at her face, you know, terribly, about the slanty eyes and all these horrible, horrible things that you never say to people. And, um, but she couldn't say anything. She didn't know, but her parents, they tried to help her, but they didn't understand how to deal with that type of, um, the way that these kids treated her. So she endured it, endured it, endured it, and finally, the only solace she had during recess time was to go to the library in her school. And there she discovered books. And she read and read and read. We love libraries. <laughs> and, but she didn't read about characters like herself. She learned about Anne of Green Gables and you know, other famous characters, all white, not Korean. But she still learned the love of literature. And eventually, she became a writer. Um, she writes her, um, she has a magazine, I can't, it's Catapult Magazine, she's the editor-in-chief. So anyway, so now we go, um, so anyway, her, her parents really couldn't help her, they were very loving, she really came from a very loving family, but, you know, it just struck me, you know, being the mother of a, a child born in China, and how would I feel if that happened to my child? I would do everything I could to save them and help them, and they, they did try, but there was, it was a time period where it was just not, there, things weren't in place to help her. Um, and now even, you know, my daughter's, you know, when she was in kindergarten, she was taunted a bit, which is terrible, even in Westwood. <laughs> but now she has a group of uh, special girls in her grade, she's in ninth grade, who are all Chinese. She's the only one who's adopted from China, but they've all gotten friends with her. And she's very lucky that she has people that can embrace her culture with her, um, because we don't have the same culture, but it's, it's a win-win. But Nicole didn't have that. Um, when she went to Seattle once with her family when she was 10 years old, she saw all these people there and went, oh my gosh, there are more. They look like me. Oh, you know, it was like a discovery, but they never went another time. They only went once. Not until she went off to college did she realize she wasn't alone. Can you imagine living your whole life like that? I just can't imagine. Um, so anyway, as she got old, gets older, now she's in her 30s, and she discovers things that she never she knew she would discover. She has looked for her birth family. And I don't want to tell you what happens, because I think you have to read the book. If you can get your hands on this book. Um, but it's, it's a really good read. It's, it's hard sometimes for me to read it, um, I've read a lot of books about adoption, and um, and sometimes it's really hard to read. I would love my daughter to read this eventually. I don't know if she's really ready for it yet, but maybe she is. So anyway, just highly recommend it. So the next book I'm talking about is called Just Mercy. A Story of Justice and Redemption, and this is nonfiction, um, written by Brian Stevenson, and um, it is an amazing book. It is a powerful book, and I think it's a really important book for people to read. Um, it's about Stevenson's experience working with death row inmates in Alabama. Um, he was the great-grandson of slaves. He grew up poor in Delaware, and he went to Harvard Law School, and He's you know, getting ready to go into the world for a successful career, and he went to um, Alabama to do an internship, working with the death row inmates. And um, as a result of that, he just became um, interested in helping um, defend those who are the most desperately in need. And he founded the Equal Justice Initiative to help the, the people who needed defense the most. Um, Central to this story is a man by the name of Walter McMillan. He was wrongly accused of murdering a woman, um, a white woman, he was, he was a black man, um, and there was no evidence to place him at the scene. There was a complete lack of evidence. This happened in the late 1980s, and it was in Monroeville, Alabama which is where Harper Lee was born and raised, and they, held, they take a lot of pride in that fact, yet this man was wrong, 
the accused, and he was convicted of this murder despite the um, lack of evidence. He was, um, after the jury convicted him, the judge converted it to the death penalty. The judge whose name was Robert E. Lee Keyes. Um, and so Stevenson worked tirelessly to free McMillan, who eventually was freed because he had been wrong. There was no evidence to suggest that he had committed this crime. So this, I think it's important because I think it points out the flaws in the justice system. McMillan isn't the only one that is featured in this book. There are actually, sadly, many cases like that of people who are on death row and they are exonerated because they did not commit the crime. Um, it's not for the faint of heart, but there is now a young adult version of the book, which I think is great because I think it's also an important book for young people to read because I think it's, they just, people just need to learn that this is, that this is going on and it shouldn't be. So this is also being made into a movie. Um, it's coming out next year, starring Jamie Foxx and Brie Larson. So I think that that will be a good movie, but an extremely powerful book by a very talented and gifted man. Uh, the next book I want to talk about is IQ by Joe Ide. It's pronounced, I had to look it up. Um, he's a Japanese American author, and this is his first novel at age 58, which I thought was pretty cool. He uh, bounced around doing different third book actually just came out in the series. There's two books after this, but you definitely want to read them in order. This is the first one. Um, so Joe E. E. Day grew up in South Central, uh, the South Central neighborhood of LA, which is a pretty, enough, pretty tough neighborhood in LA. And the book takes place in South Central LA. And the lead character is IQ. His, it stands for Isaiah Quintale. And I see it's double meaning because he is also very smart. And the, um, the author said that he was inspired by Sherlock Holmes when he wrote the book. And he, and he really is very much of a Sherlock Holmes character. He's a private investigator, but he's a young, very young African American kid from this tough neighborhood who's sort of fallen into being a private investigator. Um, so it's definitely a fresh look at the Sherlock Holmes tradition. And also sort of a fresh look of, I'm a big fan of the uh, sort of detective fiction set in LA, the old fashioned kind of, um, what the word is, <coughs> um, But, so the book goes back and forth between his teen years, his, his guardian was his older brother, his idol, and the brother gets killed in a hit and run uh, accident. And he really sort of falls apart. The IQ, the younger brother, falls apart and becomes obsessed with finding out who killed his brother. And so that those years, that story is told. And also he sort of drops out of high school and gets involved in crime and starts committing robberies with this other friend. And then it goes back and forth between then his early 20s when he's straightened out his life and has become this kind of um, unlicensed underground private investigator. And it starts out sort of he's doing very small level cases for the neighborhood. They describe the science club is getting bullied and they need somebody to step in and help or someone's grandmother's brooch was stolen and everybody knows who took it but they can't get it back. And, and being completely unpaid, they talk about him being unpaid in expired coupons and blueberry muffins. <laughs> and so eventually, you know, he's getting to the point where he needs to make money because he's not, he's moved past, he's not robbing stores anymore and he's trying to be legitimate and he needs to make money. And so his old partner in crime, comes to him with a case 
for a rapper, a very successful rapper who's made a lot of money, who's basically having a crisis, and it's it's pretty it's pretty light and humorous in many parts, and this rapper is having kind of a meaning of life crisis. He has all the money he could ever want, but he's afraid to leave the house, and someone's trying to kill him. Nobody believes that someone's trying to kill him except for IQ. So that's the, the two crimes that he's working on in different time periods. And it's really very entertaining. And I've read the second one in the series, and it's also very good. And one of the things that I really liked about the second one, because a lot of times when you read series of, that have uh, same characters, is that the authors don't let the characters change that much. They sort of hit on a winning you mm -hmm. know, formula, and the character doesn't change that much. But in the second book, he really grows up and really wants changes, and it was very interesting. I have the third book on my coffee table, and I'm delaying reading it because I don't want it to be over. <laughs> All right, well, my second book is uh, The Third Twin by Ken Follett. I really think Ken Follett is a wonderful uh, writer. He certainly has written a lot of historical novels and some spy novels and thrillers. This is definitely a thriller. He wrote it in 1996, so it was 22 years ago. So some of the things that are in it, dealing with biotech, etc., cetera, um, which was very new then, is not that new now, but it's still, it's still wonderful and has a lot of page turner of ability as far as I'm concerned. Uh, the book deals with genetic uh, multiplication of human embryos. So the hero, heroine, hero, the heroine, or the heroine, uh, Jeannie Ferrari, is a very intelligent university researcher, and she's studying genetic components of aggression. Using a, an FBI da database, which was restricted, she discovers two young men who appear to be identical twins. One is named Steve, and the other is named Dennis. Steve is a law student, and Dennis is a convicted murderer. These twins have been born to different women at different times in different places. Now, Steve is accused of rape. However, he gets exonerated. And of course, there has to be a love situation. She's falling in love with Steve, but she wants to make sure that he is different than his murderer brother. So she escapes an attempted rape by someone who looks like Steve and who she thinks is Steve. Uh, but she finds out that Steve is home at the time that she was attacked. So. A third twin, <laughs> the identical man, a clones. She is in deep trouble. She's discovered a conspiracy here with a biotech company, a bigoted senator, and the company, the university that she works for. So this, these people deal in the multiples created by genetic manipulation. Trio in the final stages of a buyout, which is going to bring them a lot of money, are very upset about her finding out this information. They don't like her digging around. So, in order to find out the answers to these questions, can she expose them? Can they stop her? Can she, what are the, what are the, um, why is it, what, what is the, now, the uh, motivation for the clone? What sparked her interest in criminal tendencies? All kinds of questions. And if you want to know the answers, you're going to have to read the book. <laughs> and I think it's worth a read. It certainly, I read it many years ago, and I wanted to read another book by Follett that wasn't so popular. I wanted to read books that aren't as popular as some of the new ones. So I read this, I liked it, and I would recommend it as a fun read. 
also because there's uh, there's also some pretty violent sex in it. I just <coughs> want to tell you that. So if that bothers you, you don't you don't want to read it. But I see like the sex and everything. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So my final book tonight is a book that's written by David Brown, who is my latest person I would love to meet in public. He wrote the Flowers the Killer Moon, the Killers of the Flower Moon, which was an extremely popular nonfiction book. And I'm not a nonfiction reader, but I was so impressed when I heard he was coming out with another book, I thought I gotta get this. The title of this book is The White Darkness. It is, it's not a very big book, obviously, but it is a wonderful idea as a gift for somebody who was extremely impressed with the Shackleton expeditions. This is the follow-up to the Shackleton expeditions, and it reminded me of one of my sons back in elementary school where they had to dress up as some kind of a hero or some wonderful person, and we dressed him up as Shackleton. So I was delighted when this book came out, and I am actually going to get this for my husband, he's not here tonight, so that's fine. Um, it is the story of the descendants of the Shackleton crew. Uh, the names are Henry Worsley, the other name was um, Adams, um, his great-grandfather was the meteorological, me sorry, that's not meteorological, Tom, meteorological um, second shipmate on the crew of Shackleton. So this is his descendant. And then the third one was a man called William Gow. Um, Worsley was a descendant. He had a wonderful family. He had two children, but he was just fascinated and obsessed with Shackleton. Um, he spent a lot of his time trying to get memorabilia, spent a lot of money on purchasing anything that had Shackleton's name or was connected with the uh, endurance or Nimrod expeditions. And um, so when, uh, whoops, excuse me, uh, one of the um, options, he met a granddaughter of Shackleton called Alexandra, who wanted to introduce him to several different people who were in the same boat as he was, literally, very interested in expeditions and Shackleton and just the endurance of trying to um, do the expedition in the Antarctica. It, it's a wonderful book, book. It's got beautiful pictures, uh, which really bring it to life. And it really is a wonderful story that I, I believe anybody would really love to have on their bookshelf and maybe pass it down to next generations who may be interested in expeditions. Um, unfortunately, it has a, a sad ending, but it is, really is a wonderful story. So we do have it here to check out tonight if anyone would like to uh, read more about it. It's got some really good information in it. So, David Grant, The White Darkness. As many of you probably know, uh, the librarians <coughs> at this library and other, other libraries very often know your reading habits. They get to know you, they kind of know what books you like. You can come in and ask for, we have a program going on now where you can get bags of books based on what you, the kind of reading you like to do. Well, for me, anybody who knows my reading habits would never give me this book. <laughs> it is not my kind of book at all. <laughs> but the title uh, thrilled me because it came at a time I was having surgery, there were a lot of things going on, and I needed some joy in my life. So the title is Joy for Beginners by Erica Baumeister. And I loved it. <laughs> Didn't expect to, but I did. I read the whole thing. Um, it's the story of Kate, who has had a long and fierce battle with breast cancer, but is now in recovery and feeling very well. Six women from various parts of her life took care of her during her surgeries and her chemo and everything else going on. And she has them over for dinner in the summer. Um, to thank them for all the things they did for her, the, all the support. They notice that there's a brochure for White River rafting um, stuck on the refrigerator, and they ask her about it. And, uh, Kate tells them that her daughter, Robin, wants her to celebrate life and her recovery by um, 
going White River rafting the following summer so they can sign up for it now. But she's afraid to go. But she doesn't want to disappoint Robin. So she's wondering what to do. One of her very good friends, and there's wine and food involved in all of this, but um, one of her very good friends says, listen, I have a pact. If you will agree to, to step out of your comfort zone and go White River rafting, we will all do something that's out of our wheelhouse. Um, something that scares us, something that we've been putting off, something on our bucket list that we always thought we'd get to and never would. And uh, then at the end of all this, you'll go White River rafting. And Kate agrees, except she gets to pick the challenges <laughs> for each of the other women. And they're not life-threatening. They're not magical. They're just some basic things. So one is um, for a type A personality who never has patience for anything. Her task is to learn to bake really good bread, because that takes time. Uh, for another one, it's um, her husband left her and they're divorced, but she could never get rid of his books because she wanted them to go somewhere good. So her job was to get rid of his books, get that part of her life over. Each chapter follows one of the women, and it changes their lives in big and small ways. And at the very end, Kate goes like one around. Great book for, it's a woman's book, I gotta tell you, I, I will admit that. And, but it's, the, it's I read in a trade paperback too, and it's the kind I'm gonna give to a lot of my women friends. It's about, it's well written, and it has some um, marvelous insights into what makes women do what they do, or don't do what they really want to. So it's a great fast read, and it did bring me joy at a time when I needed it, so. So there's a third book I'm going to talk about. Now the cover is different. I bought mine on Amazon. It's called If I, I'm sorry, not If I Say, it's called Leave Me by Gail Foreman. She's the one who wrote If I Say. Um, she's mostly written YA novels. And I think Karen said she has another one coming. I haven't had a chance to look it up and what it is, when it is coming out, if it's an adult or if it's a young adult. Um, but I really love this book. We have it over there, and you can see the cover is different. It's got like stripes on it and things. But anyway, so um, this is a, a okay. So here I'll just start off with something a good read said. For every woman who has ever fantasized about driving past her exit on the highway instead of going home to make dinner, <laughs> for every woman who has ever dreamed of boarding a train to a place where no one needs constant attention. Meet Barry, Mary, Beth, uh, Mary Beth Kahn. She is the um, person that the book is really talking about. Um, she is a working mother. She has four-year-old twins. She has a husband that works a lot, too. Um, she's so busy in her day-to-day -day life. She lives in the Tribeca section of Manhattan. Um, she writes or own, uh, works in a magazine. Um, but. All of a sudden, she doesn't realize, she thinks she has indigestion. She keeps going about her life, la, 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 I'll have that pizza, I'll have this, I'll have that. And she's wondering why she has these pains. She doesn't realize, but actually she's having a heart attack at 44 years old. So um, she, luckily she goes to her monthly, or like yearly appointment uh, just for something else. And um, all of a sudden, they discover that she is having major problems. And so they have to get her into the hospital and she has bypass surgery. And so she's trying to, you know, kind of recover from the surgery. And um, she eventually makes it home. And her husband still needs her to do this, this, and this, and pay this and do that. And the kids want mommy, 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 mommy. And she just can't do something for herself which she really needs to do to heal. So there's a, a visiting nurse named Luca who comes out shortly after she gets back um, from the surgery and she's like trying to help her and listen to her as well as take care of her wounds and everything. And all of a sudden she just says to her, I believe you have a healthy heart. The doctors have done their part, but if you want to get better, really better, you're going to have to do that for yourself. So the next morning, she gets on the train, and she leaves everybody, packs her bag quietly, and leaves. 
Now, I don't always support something like that. But I, <laughs> I, I must I, you know, I have two kids and I've been busy. I don't know if I've ever really thought of getting on a train meeting, but sometimes you do want to maybe stay at the store a little longer and then you want to play some music. But she actually gets on a train. And guess where she goes? Okay, another you know, thing in my past, Pittsburgh. <laughs> <laughs> and she just takes a whim and goes to Pittsburgh. And, um, but you come to find out there's a reason that she goes there. Um, she doesn't want people to know really who she is. She, I think she calls herself MB. I don't know if it's MB or MK or something like that. <laughs> she doesn't want people to know her past. She doesn't bring her computer with her, doesn't bring her phone. She gets a little trap phone in the um, in the train station. She just wants to be, like, just not, don't let people know her. Um, it's not like she did anything horrible, but it is big to leave your husband and children. But she does have a reason. And um, she meets a lot of, a cast of characters along the way. Um, really good people. People at Pittsburgh are pretty cool, I must say. <laughs> but, um, but she does that for herself, and there's certain reasons that you have to really read the book. I don't want to tell you, I don't know if anybody's ever read it yet, but it's, it's a good story. I really liked it. Um, some people might think it's more fluff, but I don't think it's fluff. I really liked it, and I read it this summer. I had had surgery, too, and it was nice to read something that I really enjoyed while I was recovering as well. And so I, I do recommend this book, Leave Me by Gail Ford. Thank you. So the next book that I'm going to talk about is called The Song of Achilles, and it's by Madeline Miller. Mm -hmm. And this book is um, a retelling of the Iliad by Homer. <laughs> and it is told from the, view, the point of view of Patroclus, who was Achilles' like best friend, his BFF. And um, the, the Madeline Miller creates a backstory. She, um, the, where the Iliad basically is the Trojan War, she creates a backstory for their friendship developing in boyhood. Patroclus is banished from his kingdom because he accidentally kills a boy. He goes to live where Achilles' father is. Um, Peleus is uh, the king of that kingdom. And then it just, it develops the, the relationship between the two of them where Achilles is sort of the greatest of all Homeric heroes. And then here's his loyal sidekick. Um, but it's actually, it's a really um, nice story. It's well written. It hits on all the main points of the Iliad. Um, and so they go off to war together and um, it, it, follows along, I was talking to Karen about it because her daughter is reading this at the high school, and it does really follow along with um, the main points here in this. And so when Patroclus in the Iliad, when he um, dies, that is when Achilles really <coughs> hits that rageful point where he says, okay, I'm getting involved in this now, we're going to take control of this Trojan War, and then it ends. So. This, I highly recommend this book. I read it after I read Circe. Um, Karen and I went to, Karen Gallagher and I went to a luncheon down the Cape this summer, and Madeline Miller was one of the featured authors because she, did just, she was fabulous. She was just a brilliant woman. She's a, a classics professor. She was a classics major. She's just, she, her, she said that her mother used to read to her from this at bedtime. <laughs> she, she was so funny. <laughs> she, you know, she said she couldn't get enough of the Iliad as a child. So, so she wrote, um, so she was actually talking about Circe, and I had read it for this book um, event that we went to, but then I wanted to go and read The Song of Achilles because I actually read both the Odyssey and the Iliad in college and I liked the Iliad better than the Odyssey. And I liked both Circe and The Song of Achilles, but I liked this better. And I guess that makes sense since I'm more of an Iliad fan. Um, but maybe you'll be inspired to go back and read this. Or um, we have the great courses upstairs. Um, I don't know if people are familiar with the collection. But these, um, the, the Donahue family mm -hmm. donated this um, collection of the great courses in there, terrific. Now this one, I actually listened to this as well. Um, 
And it's 12 lectures on the Iliad with a fabulous professor from the University of Maryland, Elizabeth Vandiver. Actually, Rich Wade has listened to some of these as well. I think the Aeneid or a couple, but it's actually, they're, they're great. So I would highly recommend these if you haven't had a chance to look at the collection upstairs. I would recommend those. Um, and she, uh, Madeline Miller was, she really was just like a, a fabulous personality. Um, so funny. And so we, we really couldn't get enough of her. We were hoping that maybe someday she would come here and speak. So we'll still, we'll continue to work on this. But um, this one was a really enjoyable to read. So my last book is I'll Be Gone in the Dark. And the subtitle is One Woman's Obsessive Search for the Golden State Killer. And this is not a good bedtime reading. <laughs> I, honestly, it made me think about my home safety a little bit. <laughs> you know, sort of reassess the window situation. You know, sliding glass over. Yes, that's right. So it is a true, it's nonfiction, it's a true story of the Golden State Killer who uh, sexually assaulted more than 50 women and murdered at least 10 or 12 people in the 1970s and 80s, in the, mostly in the Sacramento area, and then stopped and was uncaptured for you know, 40 years until just this last year. Um, and he was captured using a, a DNA from a distant, distant cousin who had posted their DNA on one of these public And I have to say, I was reluctant to start it because of the nature of the crimes, and I sort of made a deal with myself that I was going to start and see how, you know, how it went. And she does; she is pretty frank in her descriptions of the crimes, and she interviewed a lot of the rape victims and a lot of the families and the survivors of the people who were killed. And it's it is really done very respectfully, and it's you know you have to you have to describe it because you have to tell the story. sensationalized anyhow and the book just grabs you and there's a lot of drama sort of inside and outside of this book because he was caught about two months after the book was published um, and also she the author died mm -hmm. in the middle of writing it she was about five years into writing it and she died um, and you know she died from an undiagnosed heart and also a mix of drugs that she was, so it was sort of an over, accidental overdose aggravated by this heart condition. And I think that her husband at least believes that it was partly the stress of writing the book because the book really did kind of haunt her. And she talks about that in the, in the book about how it really was taking over her life because, and that's one of the things that's so neat about the book is you really get to know her, you really feel her in the book, and this real determination that she wants to be the one to catch him. And she interviews detectives that had their entire careers, you know, begin and end, trying to solve this these crimes and, and never solved them. And she even works with some of these retired detectives. And there's many and many of them. And she talks to the victims, and community and you know it's an exhaustive really search and she was also given access to the police files it was sort of unusual the, the police I think the police you get the feeling that they sort of really came to respect her through the years and handed over things that they wouldn't normally hand over to a writer of information but so after she died her husband who's Patton Oswald he's an actor and comedian he really said that he thought it was important that the book be finished, and so he hired her, one of her lead researchers and another writer to finish it. And that's one of the really interesting things about the book itself is that they didn't try to sort of imitate her style and finish it smoothly so you couldn't tell the difference between what her writing was and theirs. They very carefully sort of tell you when they're going into a section that's 
built on her notes or from an article that she published before or directions that they thought she was going to go in. And so you can really see, you know, you can see the parts that she didn't write. And it wasn't like she started out halfway and stopped. She had written some of the end pieces. And so it, it's really sort of interspersed between her writing and their work. And but it's also fascinating because he was, you know, in the 1970s there was no such thing as DNA testing, and so he had left all sorts of DNA at his crime scenes, and so it's fascinating to watch how forensics and police work changed in the 40 years and how they were able to find each other. And the last section of the book, she really predicts almost exactly how he would get caught, and it's really. Very riveting and, and interesting, and I really I finished it and I thought, damn, she didn't get to see it. <laughs> <laughs> I just had that wish she'd seen him get caught. Well, I'm going to end up on a happy note. <laughs> yes. I wanted to find a book that would make me laugh, so I chose one of David Sedaris's books may talk pretty one day. <clears throat> this book consists of 28 little chapters. The first part deals with his life in North Carolina, and the second part deals with his life in uh, France with his partner. So I'm going to read you a few excerpts, okay, because I think that's the best way to just describe the humor here. And he, as a child, had a list and he didn't think it was much, but apparently they felt that he needed to have a speech therapist. So the speech therapist tried to get him to say the letter S, and he avoided words with the letter S. So they sort of had a duel back and forth. So, she said, what are your plans for the holidays? Well, I usually remain here, you know open a gift from my family. Only one, she asked? Maybe eight or ten. <laughs> Not six or seven? <laughs> Rarely, I said. And what do you do on December 31st, New Year's Eve? On the final day of the year, we take down a pine tree in our living room and eat marine life. <laughs> at avoiding the yeses, she said. I have to hand it to you. You're tougher than most. Then she goes on to say in another part, I tried my best to work with you and the others, but sometimes a person's best just isn't good enough. She took another cookie and turned it over her hands. I really wanted to prove to myself and make a difference in people's lives, but it's hard to do your job when you're met with so much resistance. My students don't like me, and I guess that's just the way it is. What can I say? As a speech therapist, I'm a complete failure. She moved her hands to her face, and I worried that she might start to cry. Hey, look, I said, I'm falling. She <laughs> <laughs> said, ha ha, I got you. <laughs> she laughed much more than she needed to, and was still at it when she signed the form recommending me for the following year's speech therapy program. Four, indeed. You've got some work ahead of you, Miss. <laughs> so, so that's the first part of it. The second part, when he is in France, first of all, he's in uh, Normandy, and he's trying to learn French. Uh, he has a tough time with it. Um, so he is, uh, let's see now. So, just on my fifth trip to France, I limited myself to words and phrases that people actually use. From the dog owners, I learned, shut up, lie down, who shit on the carpet. <laughs> the couple across this road taught me to ask questions correctly, and the grocer taught me to count. Things began to come together, and I went from speaking like an evil baby to speaking like a hillbilly. <laughs> Is them the thoughts of cows? I'd ask, pointing to the calf brains in the front window. 
I want me some lamb chops with handles on. <laughs> then he got to Paris, where he had a wickedly strict teacher who had no patience with him. And he was, uh, this time he was 41 years old. So he says, my only comfort was the knowledge that I was not alone. Huddled in the hallways and making the most of our pathetic French, my fellow students and I engaged in the sort of conversation commonly overheard in refugee camps. Sometime we cry alone at night. <laughs> That'd be common for I also, but be more strong you. <laughs> Much work and someday you talk pretty. People start love you soon, maybe tomorrow. <laughs> Over time, it became impossible to believe that any of us would ever improve. Fall started and it rained every day, meaning we would now be scolded for the water dripping from our coats and umbrellas. It was mid-October when the teacher singled me out saying, Every day spent with you is like having a cesarean session. <laughs> and it struck me that for the first time since arriving in France, I could understand every word someone would say. <laughs> Understanding doesn't mean that you suddenly speak the language. Far from it. It's a small step, nothing more. Yet its rewards are intoxicating and deceptive. The teacher continued the diatribe, and I settled back bathing in the subtle beauty of each new curse and insult. <laughs> you exhaust me with your foolishness and reward my efforts with nothing but pain. Do you understand me? The world opened up, and it was with great joy that I responded, I know the thing you speak exact now. Talk me more, please, plus, plus, please. <laughs> Wonderful. All these books are wonderful. You just, they just made you laugh. Now, just a little bit about laughter. Remember the Reader's Digest had always had a part that said laughter is the best medicine. Well, it's true. It doesn't cost anything. It doesn't require a prescription. And why is laughter good for us? Laughter relieves the stress we have. Laughter releases endorphins, which are our natural uh, painkillers. It relieves blood pressure, or lowers it at least. It provides an internal workout, it makes you feel better. It's a tranquilizer without side effects. Laughter is contagious, be a carrier. <laughs> so I just have a, um, a couple of things that I wanted to mention briefly finish reviewing all our books and we hope that you found the night interesting. We have loads here if you'd like to check them out. And also our gift suggestions, both displays will be in the front hallways for the next couple of weeks. But we have some really wonderful programs coming thanks to the Friends of the Library. They're a huge support for us. This is Making Mysteries at Holiday Improv Edition. It's going to be next Wednesday, which is December 5th. Um, believe it or not, but it really is, it's part of the Sister in Crime series where we have four authors who come and they get the crowd, the, the crowd involved and they set up a, a really interesting mystery, can be cozy mystery and they feed off the audience to see what kind of characters they'd like to create, so that's a great night. Um, it is going to be on next Wednesday at 7 o'clock. Uh, the other one, we have this big program coming up on December 8th, it is called Winter Merriment. This is going to be on a Saturday, and um, this is, a, I would say, if at all you're around and you're not busy, it would be a great event to be at. We have several authors coming. We have Fiona Davis, the masterpiece. She also wrote the address. We have William Martin, who's got Bound for Gold right now, and he's written several books, very popular author. We have uh, Casey Sherman and Dave Wedge, who wrote the inside story of Tom Brady's fight for redemption. We have Hank Philip Ryan coming. We also have uh, Meredith Goldstein, who wrote Can't Help Myself. And then we have a local uh, food author who writes a lot of cookbooks. So they're all coming to the library here. It'll be an open event. You can stop and chat with them. They'll sign books. They're, um, we're going to get the kids involved, where you can send cards to the troops. There will be ornament, decorating ornaments, and cookie decorating. So it really is going to be a very festive day, and that will be December 8th at 2 o'clock. 
So just outside the door, there's little handouts where you can take them home, put them on your fridge as a reminder, and also our December calendars. So thank you all for coming tonight, and thank you for anyone who's going to view us at home. And um, thank you guys for coming.